It's difficult to do in the darkness, but I get Khadijah to wedge the tip of the screwdriver into the latch of the manacle on my left hand. Now hold still, I say, hefting the large hammer in my right. What if you miss and hit me, she asks. I'll try not to, I say, but if you let go and that screwdriver go sideways, it'll go into my wrist and probably kill me. There's a pause while she processes the information. All right, she says finally, even if you hit me, I won't let go. Iniche. I take a few practice swings with the hammer, bringing it slowly over my head and tapping it onto the top of the screwdriver. I miss a few times, but I keep doing it until I'm consistently hitting the handle. I'm going to need to use a lot of force, and what I said to Khadijah is the truth. If I miss, it's likely one of us will get seriously hurt. After a few minutes, I feel my muscles relax into the new pattern. Hammering a point in the dark is not so different from splitting pods with a machete. I turn to Khadijah. Okay, this time for real. I feel her grip tighten on the screwdriver, and I try not to change the angle of my body as I lift the heavy hammer. The blow sends my wrist shooting sideways. The screwdriver is wrenched out of Khadijah's hands and scrapes against my leg, and the hammer hits her knuckles. I hear her gasp in pain. But mingled in with all those sounds is the sound of a snapping clasp, and when I feel the manacle, it now has a large gap in it. Are you okay? I ask the darkness. Ow. Oh. Her voice is muffled because she's sucking on her knuckles. Did I break any bones in your hand? A pause. No, I can move on my fingers. It just hurts. I let out a breath, relieved. Pain is something we can handle. Are you out? She asks. I shove my hand against the gap in the metal, twisting my wrist painfully and scraping the skin. Oh, good, says Khadijah, handing me the screwdriver. Now me. I pick up the hammer again. Use your other hand to hold it steady, I say. This time, since I can grip the handle of the screwdriver in my left hand, it's much easier. After only two swings, the lock gives and we're both free. Now what? A twinge of breathless excitement has crept into her voice. I still don't know whether she'll stick around or run on her own once we're free, but I know she'll help me until we're out of the shed. I walk to the rear of the shed, toolbox still in my hands, and put it by the wall closest to the forest and farthest from the fire. The one that hopefully no one will notice has been tampered with until it's too late. I hand her the screwdriver. Help me loosen these boards, I say, and we set to work. Though our movements are slow and clumsy with exhaustion, neither of us talks of sleeping. It takes much longer than I think it will to loosen the boards to the point where the hole is big enough for us. By the time we've crawled out, the crescent moon is past the midpoint of the sky. It's eerie to stand at the edge of the camp in the half light and see places that are usually filled with people. The fire pit is a darker gray hole in the middle of the light gray clearing, like a cigarette burn in a piece of cloth. The fermenting cacao seed piles are ghostly lumps in the landscape. The drying racks, shadowy skeletons. In front of us, the sleeping hut looms, quiet and still. You'd never guess there were more than a dozen boys inside. And over everything, a hush, filled only by the haunting night sounds of La Brosse. I clutch the toolbox to my chest and we creep across the packed earth of the empty yard to the sleeping hut. I shuffle around until I find a splintered piece of wood. I press my lips to the crack and whisper shout, Sadu! Then realizing that Sadu's probably in no condition to answer me, I switch to Yusef! After what seems like forever, but it's probably only a minute or so, I hear a tired scuffle on the other side of the planks. Amadou? My name is half a yawn. Yes, who's this? I ask, splaying my fingers on the wooden boards as if it will get me closer to my brother. It's Yusef! Yusef, how's Seydu? Is he all right? There's a brief pause. What do you mean? asks Yusef. He's not with you? What? No. Another pause. Then Yusef's voice again, this time very much awake. Amado, I don't know what to tell you. He's not in here with us either. There are only 12 of us in here tonight. I counted. For a brief moment, I feel an odd kinship with Yusef. I never knew anyone else was counting the things that mattered. But then I remembered my real kinship, Seydu, and the fact that he's in neither of the places he should be. I shake off my days and realize that Yusef is still talking. 
at their house. But really, Amadou, you should get back into that shed. I don't even know how you got out, but you should go back. It won't do you or say to any good in the morning if the bosses don't find you in there. I'll figure out where he is tomorrow, okay? Iniche, Yusef, I say, and ease away from the sleeping hut. I'm thanking him for offering to help, but saying I plan to accept it. But Yusef doesn't know that, and I hear him shuffle to a sleeping spot and lie down. I feel like I'll never be able to sleep again. I have to find Sadu. Why did the bosses not put him with the other boys or in the tool shed with me? Where is he? I feel as if my soul has been hacked to pieces with a machete. What if he's dead? What if the reason he's not in the sleeping hut is because he's in a new grave somewhere, dug by the bosses while Khadijah and I played around at escaping? A hand on my elbow makes me jump. Munkera, Khadijah asks. My mouth moves, but no sound comes out. I clear my throat and try again. Sadu's not there, I manage. Khadijah looks as stunned by the news as I am. Where is he then? She asks. She whips her head from side to side, her oval face creased with concern, scanning the camp as if Sadu might be somewhere there, sleeping out in the open. I shake my head. I don't know, but I have to go look for him. Aside from the storage lean-to, there's only one other building that has a roof. The boss's house. I've gone ten paces down the beaten earth track that leads over the hill to their house before I realize that Khadija isn't beside me. I turn and see her standing exactly where I left her, facing into the forest. A cold finger of fear traces my spine as I imagine being entirely alone. Khadija? She glances in my direction. I could go now, she says softly. The finger turns into an icy hand that grips my heart and squeezes. You could, I admit. She looks away over the hills again, then she turns around. She walks to me as if every step hurts. When she's level with me, she speaks. Going to the boss's house is the stupidest thing I could possibly do if I'm really trying to escape, she says. I wait. But, she sighs. The only reason you weren't with Sadu the day he got hurt was because you were tied up. The only reason you were tied up was because I ran. She takes a deep breath. You called me selfish a while ago. I guess I am. If I had the chance to do that again, I would probably run again. But I will do this thing now. I owe it to Sadu. With that, she pushes stiffly past me, spine straight, and leads the way up the moonlit track. Grateful beyond words, I follow her, staying one step behind all the way, just in case she changes her mind.